The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Lord be with Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field, which a person finds and hides again, and out of joy goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant searching for fine pearls. When he finds a pearl of great price, he goes and sells all that he has and buys it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown in the sea, which collects fish of every kind. When it is full, they haul it ashore and sit down to put what is good in buckets. What is bad, they throw away. Thus will be at the end of age. The angels will go out and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where they'll be wailing and grinding their teeth. Do you understand all these things? They answered, yes. And he replied, then every scribe who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings from the storeroom the both the new and old. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I think I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Father Michael Moore, and I'm a member of a missionary group our official name is St. Patrick's Missionary Society, but here in the States, we just go as the St. Patrick Fathers. And I've been asked to talk about the missions, so really all I can do is tell my own story. I was ordained in 1984 in Ireland, and then I spent the following 10 years in a very small country in Central Africa called Malawi. It's the most beautiful country. And the people are a very warm, gentle people. But unfortunately, their country is officially the fourth poorest in the world. For example, where I worked in the south of the country, the vast majority of the people had absolutely no work. And those who found casual labor they worked for as little as 30 cents a day in a country where gas costs about $5 a gallon. 18%, that is one in five of the children die before the age of five years because of malaria and malnutrition. The life expectancy of a man or woman is just 40 years. Could you imagine if all of us over 40 were removed from this church or from Livermore? And on top of that, their country was ruled by a ruthless dictator called Dr. Banda for 30 years. And under his tyranny, there was absolutely no freedom. There was no freedom of press. There was no freedom of speech. There was almost, if you could imagine it, no freedom of thought. It was too dangerous to have your own views. Anyone who mentioned anything, even remotely contrary to that of Dr. Banda, he or she was picked up by the police and then went missing. Dr. Banda continually boasted, in his own words, all opposition is crocodile meat and we knew what he meant by crocodile meat. Despite dreadful poverty, no one was allowed to publicly say they were in need. The reason was because on the international scene, Dr. Banda continually boasted 
that due to his wise and his dynamic leadership, his people were all well fed, well housed, and well clothed. Therefore, to reveal the truth of the situation within the country would be the very same as calling Dr. Banda a liar in public. Because of fear, intimidation, everyone agreed with everything he said. And as a young priest, when I arrived in the country just after being ordained, I must admit, very quickly I was confused, I was frustrated, and I was very disappointed with our own Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was the largest church in the country, yet it never once publicly said a word against Dr. Banda. To me, the church was just another prisoner, just another victim of the system. However, thankfully, I was very, very wrong. The Spirit of God was working away quietly within the Catholic Church. And in March 1992, a secretly prepared pastor letter from our eight bishops was read out in every Catholic parish. The letter began with the words of Isaiah, the words that Jesus actually selected for his first ever public address. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind. The letter then highlighted every injustice within the country. And that was a very, very emotional Sunday morning. However, the following Tuesday, all eight Catholic bishops were rounded up, interrogated, and then it was decided all Catholic bishops are to be executed. Their crime, they had offended the president. Fortunately, the international media and in particular, the BBC World Service, they heard about the plot against the Catholic bishops. And it's interesting how they heard about it. Our phones were tapped and recorded. But one of our priests was a native Irish speaker, and he, com he communicated back to Ireland in Gaelic, and his relation communicated to London in English. And as you can imagine, very few people speak Irish in Africa. <laughs> so the BBC got the report and thankfully they ran their report. The government was now trapped and embarrassed. It had to release our bishops, but it was wounded and wounded badly. And in retaliation, many of our Catholic churches were attacked and burnt. Any person with a rosary beads was harassed. In one dreadful day in Blantyre, at least 200 innocent people were shot dead. And one of those was a member of our own Catholic soccer team in the parish I worked in at the time. And it was a team I coached and played on myself. Then the government turned their anger towards missionaries and three of our 16 priests were deported. One of those was the Irish bishop. The rest of us lived in fear, unsure of our own futures. But fortunately for us, the governments of the United States and the European Union countries, the financial donor countries, they backed the Catholic Church and our struggle for democracy. And that was the turning point. With that, the people stood up and voiced their opinions openly. A movement for freedom ignited by just eight Catholic bishops and one pastor letter for Lent was now like a burning fire throughout the entire country. So much so that in May 1994, just before I left Africa, Malawi had its first ever free general election. Dr. Banda was finally removed from power by a free people. 
Since then, the country has had four different presidents. But the most important thing is that the transition of power in each case has always been peaceful. And that is incredible if you think of what has happened in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, not to mention Syria. And I think it was the presence, the strong presence of a Catholic church. Many people, but especially my own family, my nephews and, nephews and nieces back in Ireland, often wonder why am I a missionary priest, always saying goodbye to them. And I often wonder myself. But I think I now know the reason. It's because I've seen the tremendous good that our Catholic Church can do in bringing political freedom to a forgotten, unheard of nation in the very heart of Africa. But that's only part of our work. There is another type of freedom that we Christian missionaries must bring with us. And it is a freedom perhaps taken for granted in many Western countries. It might be difficult for us here in this beautiful church on this beautiful morning to imagine an entire country that has never heard of a loving God. And I do want to stress loving God. Peoples who have never heard of the name of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of our Lord, and therefore are completely unaware of our own resurrection from the dead. I've seen such situations. People living with witchcraft and superstition. And probably the worst thing I ever had to experience was to see a young woman and her two children expelled from their home and village after her husband was taken and eaten by a crocodile. Because of pagan beliefs, she was the one eventually accused of sending the reptile after her husband, the way a rancher here would send a dog after sheep or cattle. Because of fear and superstition, she had to be expelled from her own home. Situations like that have convinced me that probably the most important part of our missionary work today is freeing people from the captivity of fear. In Africa, in many parts, it means freeing people from the captivity of fear of believing that death is the result of the local witch doctor and his medicine. In Western countries today, it can mean freeing people from the fear of believing that death is final. Many people in the Western world really do not accept or believe in an afterlife. But Christianity, our message of resurrection, it really gives us a whole new freedom in our lives. It gives us a whole new meaning to life. But the question I've been facing is, how would you explain resurrection in today's world, in simple terms? And last year, I turned 60. And I was back in Ireland, and a friend of mine who turned 70, he said to me, Father Michael, I want you to know now that you have more years behind you than you have ahead of you. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what an unchristian way to look at life. <laughs> and then I came across an expression by De Chardin, and he said, we are not human beings on a spiritual journey. We are spiritual beings on a human journey. Think about it. We are actually spiritual beings having a human experience for 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years. What we are passing through. And many of you parents and grandparents, you've been on road trips with young children. 
what is the most common question you're asked by those children? <laughs> Are we there yet? <laughs> Are we there yet? Well, in light of the resurrection, I see life as a homeward bound journey. I see life as a homeward bound journey. And as much as I enjoy the journey, as much as I enjoy a vacation, we all love to get home. We all love to get back home. So, am I there yet? The answer to my question is, well, at least I have more miles behind me than I yet have to travel. And that's because I genuinely believe and trust in the resurrection. It is real freedom in our lives. When we believe in the resurrection, we can enjoy life all the more. I've had the privilege, and I, I do mean the privilege, of spending 10 years on the missions. But I also realize we don't have to go abroad any longer to be missionary. Every one of you here are missionaries in so many different ways. First of all, your physical presence in this church alone is supporting every other person around you. Your physical presence. Also, by coming to church, your example is challenging every person that sees you. People who no longer give God a place in their lives have to be impressed by your example. Young parents who bring young children to Mass, you are really special missionaries. The young people here, and I was amazed by the number of young people I saw coming into church, you too are special, special missionaries in our society today. You can reach people that we will never reach. Grandparents, you who try to pass on your Christian faith to your grandchildren in very obvious and, and less obvious ways every chance you get by teaching their prayers, by teaching, by your example. You are missionaries in today's world. Secondly, you are missionary by your prayers. I read recently that about 24 missionaries are killed every year on the missions. So please keep all missionaries and also all your loved ones working and serving abroad in your thoughts and in your daily prayers. Thirdly, you are missionary by your financial support. We, the St. Patrick Fathers, literally depend completely on your support. There is a second collection, as you're aware, this morning. And anything you give in the second collection goes to the missions. If you're making out a check, make a payable to St. Francis a Parish. Oh, sorry, not France, St. Charles Borromeo. If you're making a check, make a payable to St. Uh, Charles Borromeo and put it in the second collection. If you're caught by surprise, we have special envelopes. We actually ran out of the regular envelopes. But we've used these special collections, envelopes, and just write uh, second collection, the missions. And you can bring it back next week. Okay, enough about that. I want to tell you that your money makes a huge difference. I've had the bad fortune of witnessing drought, followed by flooding, followed by two earthquakes all in one parish in one year. And as a result of everything, with 16,000 people to feed for 13 months, just two of us at the mission, I can happily report not one of those people died. Thanks to you and your support. Because of your support of the missions, we, the St. Patrick Fathers, and other missionary groups we were literally on ground zero as each disaster happened. And because we were on ground zero, on the inside, we could respond immediately because of you. And that 
made all the difference. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in the Diocese of Oakland. I want to thank you on behalf of all missionaries, but especially the St. Patrick Fathers. I also want to thank you on behalf of 16,000 people in Our Lady of Fatima Parish, Malawi, Central Africa. And I want to thank you in their language. Zikomo Kwambiri, Zikomo Ndimtima Wanga Wontse, which means thank you very much. Thank you from the very depths of our hearts. God bless. <laughs>